Hi, I'm an artist and an educator. And this thing is my best friend and my worst enemy. It's big, white, blank. It's always waiting somewhere in the corner. It's like a barnacle. It insisted on coming out here with me. You know, my medium is paint, which is a silent medium. But she screams at me every day to do something important with her, to say something with her. But she's silent. So anyway, you know, as we go, it's, we all have our blank canvases. You know, and I'm wondering, we have this in common. Which blank canvas are you contending with at the moment? Is it that essay that you need to write for your college, your dream college? Or is it that poem that's burning to get out of you? You know, maybe it's just cleaning your closet. Whatever it is, we all have to contend with our blank canvases. So the best thing to do is to get started. So I'm just going to wrestle her over here. She doesn't want to go, but I'm just going to sit there for a minute. So the first thing we have to do is make a mark. Go ahead and make a mark. Uh, you know, any project you have out there has to start somewhere. Behind me is a picture of a painting I embarked on right around the same time I embarked on this TEDx talk. And it was a very ambitious painting for me, unlike anything I've ever done. It's a labyrinth. It's actually located at the, behind the Delaware Art Museum, not far from here. And I started with a line, quick erase, another line, Bigger erase, you know, until I got a line that worked, and then I just went with it. So I thought I would start this talk by saying, let's go ahead and make our mark. And why don't you and I go on a little walk right now? OK. So as we embark on our walk together around the labyrinth, some of the things that I've learned, the first one I'd like to talk about is know what you don't know. It's very important to grasp this, because in today's day and age, with Google at our fingertips, we think we need to be the expert. We have to have the answers. Well, in fact, you don't, you know? Just let yourself admit what you don't know. And you don't have to be the know-it-all, you just have to be resourceful and get those people near you who do know. We all have our own areas of expertise. So knowing what you don't know is critical. As a matter of fact, it can liberate you. Quick story, the building behind me is located at Penn State University, the Carnegie Building, School of Communications. You can picture me scurrying across campus with my oversized shoulder padded dress, running up those steps into my college interview. Mr. Harry Davis was waiting for me. He was the director of communications at DuPont. Harry was in a little swivel chair. He swiveled around when I came in. And he said, in a gravelly voice, hey, kid, you catch my lecture last night? And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, mm -mm. no, no, Mr. Davis, I'm sorry, did not make your lecture. He looks at me. He was a chain smoker, made him even more intimidating. He looks at me, takes a drag looks back at me, and we continued the interview. And I thought, that's it. I just blew my chances with, with DuPont. Well, it turns out I got an offer, and Harry himself called me and said, you know what, kid? I like your honesty. So you know what? Know what you don't know and admit it. Next thing is, there is no easy pass. Sorry, no easy pass. It's our default. We love to go quickly everywhere. Coffee to go. You know, we want to just scoot to the top, and we don't really want to slow down. You know, I have developed a thing called toll booth anxiety over the years. There's so many options, you know, easy pass, coins only, tickets and coins, exact change. And I'm like, oh, I just go through the easy pass, you know. Um, and really, in reality, I might suggest to you taking the slow lane will teach you the most. It's, it's along the slow lane that we meet people and that we punch our time cards, so to speak, where we learn how to do those mundane jobs that are in the underbelly of an organization 
And that's where we learn the most, and that's where we learn this thing called empathy, which everyone talks about that we should all have. And that's how you get it, the slow lane. Uh, you know, take a walk with a four-year-old if you're having trouble, and you won't go very fast, <laughs> and you'll notice things along the way. See the big picture. So as we're making our way around our labyrinth together, you know, oftentimes we're just looking at one foot in front of the other. And we don't really take a step back and see the big picture often. Use the wide-angle lens or the panoramic. And I would submit to you that we should check things. We should test things. Uh, test things culturally. Test things generationally. You know, let's say you have a problem you're trying to solve. When's the last time you tried it on your grandparents? the 70-year-olds, the 80-year-olds out there. They have so much to offer and so many insightful things to tell you. Also, check it out culturally. You know, you have an idea. Well, maybe you didn't, you're not the first with that, that question or that idea or that problem. You know, maybe another country has already solved it. Why reinvent the wheel? Quick uh, story, the, the little youngster behind me is our second child. You know, his name is Hugh. H-U-G-H, Q, Q. Don't you love that name? I love it. <laughs> it just rolls off your tongue, Q. So we, Hugh was born in Delaware, and we didn't know it, but soon after Hugh was born, we were to move to Luxembourg, Europe. Centrally located in Europe, has its own dialect, Luxembourgish, and in the shops and restaurants, they speak French. Well, the French, have a difficulty pronouncing the letter H. As a matter of fact, they don't. As a matter of fact, they might say something to you like, I'm so happy to meet you. You know, no H. Well, we made our way over to Luxembourg, and my son, Hugh, my daughter, Maggie, we were walking in the park. Our neighbor approaches us, and she says, Bonjour, Maggie. We say, Bonjour, Madame. Bonjour, Ig. <laughs> Wait, uh, Ig, Ig, who's Ig? Uh, Ig, your son, Ig. And I looked at Hugh, and I said, okay, Ig. <laughs> so we did that for six years while we lived there. Had I seen the big picture, we may have still named him Hugh, but you know what, just test it. Test your thoughts and your ideas. Cover your lemon, too. You know, um, I don't think we spend enough time talking about this. People can get hurt. <laughs> Cover your lemon. Story here. I was at a DuPont luncheon, circular table, and true to form, enthusiastically squeezing my lemon into my iced tea. And doesn't the lemon juice shoot across the table into the eye of Wendy Israel, who was a high flyer at Burson Marsteller, New York? the PR firm we were working with. Ow, I, as Wendy was there, like staggering from the table, <laughs> like clutching her eye, which was now clearly inflamed. She looked at me and I was, I just didn't know what happened. And she said, Aaron, cover your lemon. <laughs> and you know, as I got a little older and wiser and walking around the labyrinth a bit, I realize there's a deeper message there. Cover your lemon, okay? Um, how many times do we spew acidic things from our mouth in the forms of rumor, maybe in the forms of unkind words, or just negativity? You know, keep it covered. Cover your lemon and be kind to people. The world revolves around relationships, building rapport. Treat people well and they will remember that and you'll go further on your path. Make a mess. Completely underrated, okay? When is the last time someone gave you full permission to make a mess? My children behind me have the, just the joy in their eyes as they were making a big mess. And you know what? We don't do it enough. We, we used to, when we were in kindergarten, we wear smocks and bibs and drop cloths and gone are those days, but I really wish they weren't. I wish every day we could be given permission to make a mess. It's only then that we give up control and we accidentally stumble on things and we test things, we take risks, you know, and there's beauty to be found in a mess. So many great things have been 
discovered through messes, things like silly putty, totally accidental, antibiotics too, so big and small things through making a mess. Improvise. Now, as we're making our way around our labyrinth of life, we think we have it all lined up, especially when you get to be my age, you think, got it all figured out. Invariably, we don't. Weather will not cooperate, technology will fail us, uh, we fail ourselves. So you're, you're left with having to improvise, which is really just recovering, you know, from um, when you're in a jam, doing whatever it takes to get it done. Quick story here, I'm gonna take you back to Luxembourg, it's 1998, and we were, my husband and I were so excited, we got a babysitter, I got a new dress, I got nails done, we were going out to dinner, New Year's Eve. I wanted lamb chops very badly. So the sitter calls, and between her broken English and my broken French, we were new to the country, I figured out, je suis malade. She was sick. Okay, pivot, plan B. So I go to the butcher, make my way to the market. You know, my typical MO at the butcher in Luxembourg was to look, scan the window, point to the piece of beef I want, and then hold up how many. And so I'm in line, New Year's Eve, kind of a stressful day. The butcher does not look pleased. He looks especially grumpy. And I'm just there, I'm panicking because I don't see the lamb chops. And the line gets closer and closer. I'm now face to face with the grumpy butcher. And he says, Madame. And I say, And the grumpy butcher smiles and says, Agnu, Agnu, that's the French word for lamb. And I got my four chops, and the woman behind me taps me on the shoulder and she says, Perhaps I can help you. I'm a French teacher. <laughs> so not only did I get my lamb chops, I got the French teacher, and everybody was happy. All because I improvised. And yes, animal sounds do count. Okay? So. Back to the labyrinth painting I shared with you at the beginning of my talk. I'm showing you the painting midway behind me. And it's uncomfortable to share this with you, but I was struggling. I didn't want to finish it. It was exhausting. And I wanted to walk away. The shadows weren't working. I was feeling very inadequate. And how many times in our life, when we talk about our own blank canvases, do we feel inadequate and we're so afraid of failure? But you know what? I just said, let me finish this, put my name on it, I gotta own it. Good or bad, it's mine. So I did finish it, and I wanna share it with you now. Let me go back, share it. Um, I'm sharing my final piece called Labyrinth with you, not because I'm trying to brag or boast or sell it, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I'm sharing it with you actually because we have a duty to share. We have a duty to share with one another and we all have gifts. We have to share it because you don't know who you're gonna trigger next to you. You're gonna spark somebody else, and we all rely on each other for that. So please, don't be afraid to share what's on your blank canvas, and go ahead right now and make a mark. Thank you.